The mystery of the Trinity is both the source and crown of the Christian faith and life. One God and three divine persons. They are really distinct from each other but mutually related by love, for as sacred scripture reveals, God is love. His being is love. If God were alone and solitary, he could not love from all eternity. All Catholic worship, life, and doctrine comes from and leads back to the triune God. And if we get this wrong, everything falls apart. And unfortunately, a lot of people usually do, and then they hand that on to another generation. How do they get it wrong? Either in an analogy that they use to try to explain the Trinity, or trying to oversimplify the Trinity by using language and words that are not correct. For example, one homily I heard growing up, the preacher was using interchangeably nature and person. They are not the same thing. They cannot be used interchangeably. There is a distinction. One divine nature, three divine persons. If you start using that interchangeably, what we get is one divine person, three divine natures, which brings us to three gods, which is not what we believe as a monotheistic religion. I remember it so vividly that I call that Sunday Heresy Sunday. And obviously this preacher and others don't intend to preach heresy, but it becomes confusing, especially to our young people who absorb so much of what we say and do. This confusion among our children, teenagers, and young adults usually leads to many questions and unavoidable conversations about the Trinity. When I go to school visits, for example, I get this question quite frequently. How can God be one God and three persons at the same time? Great question. And by means of our own reason, we cannot deduce the fact that God is a trinity. This we know only through the self-revelation of Jesus Christ and his divine identity as Lord. The entire Christian faith hinges on who he is. Now here we find our problem. In the early church, the problem was one of translation in the book of Proverbs. And while this book has fallen into oblivion in modern times and contained what may well be one of the most consequential theological passages in the entire Old Testament, to a large extent, the Arian crisis revolved around how one interpreted the single chapter from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 8, that which we hear in our first reading, why it is placed here on Trinity Sunday. Thus says the wisdom of God, the Lord created me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of long ago. One line. One verse. No big deal. The early church fathers universally held that Proverbs 8 described the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, whom the New Testament describes as Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. No big deal. Wrong. The word created in Hebrew, kana can mean either acquire or create. Arius, a priest, and his followers argued that kana means created, and thus the Son should be viewed as a creature, and hence a lesser being than God the Father. Effectively, Jesus was not God. He was like God, but not equal with God. So when our children say, Jesus is the Son of God, but he's not God, that's what they mean. That's where they're going. They're falling into this Arian heresy. But Catholics argued, like St. Athanasius and St. Gregory, would argue that either kana means acquired, upholding the uncreated equality of the Son with the Father, or that the word created refers to the mystery of the Incarnation and not to the eternal procession of the Son from the Father, the Son being begotten, not made. 
This debate around the exegesis of this one word, this one passage, this one chapter in an obscure book in the Old Testament Proverbs, Cana, led to the Council of Nicaea, where the debate was settled and why we get words and phrases like begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. The Holy Spirit was able to lead them into this truth about who Jesus Christ is and held his divine identity as Lord. As I said, words matter, especially to avoid confusion. Now take Proverbs 8, that which we read in the first reading, and align it with what we say in the Nicene Creed, that little phrase about, I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son, our Lord. Align it together, and now you start seeing a scriptural reality of what we believe, of what we profess. It's not just pulled out of thin air or something we make up. There's a root and a foundation to it. That was the problem of the early church, which led to much blood spilled over the identity of Jesus. Churches were fought over. People fought each other. There were wars over this one aspect of who Jesus Christ is. With modern man, The problem we have is that we try to answer the questions about God with science. However, the questions about God are not ones that modern science is meant to answer. Because the field of modern science is about what we can see, observe, and deduce. Does that mean we go to faith alone? No. Because with human reason, we know for a fact that there was really a person named Jesus who was from Nazareth who walked upon the earth. If anyone says otherwise, read Roman history. Then the Babylonian Talmud and other sources of that era that speak about a person named Jesus Christ who walked upon the earth 2,000 years ago and was crucified. But in what Jesus says what he does, what he claims. In the words of C.S. Lewis, he is either a liar, a lunatic, or who he claims to be, Lord. There is much reasonable and practical evidence to suggest that Jesus is not a liar or a lunatic, but who he claims to be. Roman history tells us that Jesus died on a cross, and Jewish scholars tell us he was put to death, because of his claim to be Lord, blasphemy in their eyes. He died because he stood firm in his divine identity. Who do you know dies for a lie? Not many people. And then we start looking at their mental capacity, and are they uh, lunatics? So, okay, maybe he died because he's a little crazy. But not only that, 2,000 years later, people are still dying because of his divine identity. We have to make a choice. Who do you say that I am? Here the Holy Spirit revealed to St. Peter and to us if we open our heart to that. Jesus is Lord. And that question has eternal consequences. One of the best parts of school visits is when you break through some of the walls and obstacles in our young people that come up when we talk about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The best one yet that I can remember, it was this year, was after going through this with one class. And yes, we can talk about these things at this level with children and not dumb it down. It's a child coming up to me and saying, so Mary is Jesus' mother. And Jesus was God. That means Mary is the mother of God? Brought a smile to my face. Yep, you got it. And he walked away amazed. That same Jesus, truly God, truly man, now comes to us in the Eucharist body, blood, soul, and divinity, source and summit of our Christian life, the love of God being poured into our hearts. It's pretty awesome to be Catholic 
and celebrate our faith in the triune God, a faith that we will now profess, which leads us to eternal life in heaven, with the glory of God being revealed to us day by day, moment by moment.